the DAP for having me this evening uh, to present my uh, thoughts on, on Mr. Karpal to all of you. Uh, thank you to the family uh, for having me back. I spoke at the first memorial um, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, I think I should also say that I'm in a bit of a, a fix because not only did Tommy steal what I was going to say, that was Sri Hishamurin then finished up the rest of it. <laughs> so I suppose I could do, I could do this quite quickly. Um, I guess that's the advantage of speaking last as well. Um, so let me start by saying this. I miss Mr. Karpal a lot. Um, I miss his presence in court. Um, it was comforting in, in many ways, even though we didn't necessarily do the same kind of work. I don't do criminal uh, law work, except when it's in, in human rights related. But the mere presence of Mr. Karpal in court was enough to say, okay, we're we all right because, you know, big brother's here in, in the good sense. Um, I also miss him as a politician uh, because, you know, you could expect a spade to be called a spade. Um, and yes, while I understand real politic involves some grey, for Mr. Karpal, if it was black, it was black. And if it was white, it was white. And I think that's something we sorely need uh, in, in, at, at the present in many ways. Uh, political expediency seems to be in many ways um, clouding uh, things for all of us in, in this country and I'm hoping that maybe with tonight we can remind ourselves of the ideals that the DAP um, stands for and ideals that I think really you should be uh, looking to um, aggressively pursue, robustly. And I'm sorry if I'm, I'm out of turn in saying this at this event but I think it needs to be said since we're memorializing Mr. Karpal and everything he stood for. Now, Mr. Karpal was an inspiration. I don't think I can, I can put that any more strongly than my saying that. He inspired me um, to become a lawyer in many ways. He was one of the pivotal persons. Uh, he was a close family friend. The families are, are very close, and we were in each other's houses a lot. And I remember when he was campaigning in Jalutong, he would often stop by for a cup of tea at my house, uh, speak to my mother. But yeah, I mean, you saw his picture on the, on the posters, you saw the kids running around putting up the posters. You, you, you envied them for the fact that they were on the back of the lorries and you couldn't join them, um, uh, all of that. Um, and of course, everything that we read in the, in the newspapers and everything that we heard when we went to their houses from the lat cartoons on the walls to the, 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 the war stories uh, the kids you would, would share, he was an inspiration. Um, and he was an inspiration to me even after I became a lawyer because, um, as I'll, I'll explain shortly, uh, in many ways the work he did, uh, along with um, the late Rajaziz um, and other uh, luminaries like the late Sri Ram, um, uh, set the foundation for what is now the modern constitutional position of this country. And I think without the, the, the work that Mr. Karpal did in many ways, we would not have had the foundation to uh, make the shift that we, we managed to, to achieve uh, these last 10 years, especially with this current um, uh, federal court under the stewardship of the Chief Justice Tunku Maimun. And I think many of the achievements that you're reading about, uh, not just by me, but by other lawyers in, in, the, in the subject, uh, um, owe a lot to the, the groundwork that was done by uh, Mr. Karpal. But back to inspiration, Funnily enough, we, I'm not sure if she's here, my pupil, when she came in to interview not too long ago, um, one of the things she told us was that she had wanted to do, uh, become a pianist. So that sort of puts a glitch in the interview because let me think, what are you doing here then, right? <laughs> and then, so the obvious question then says, yes, but what happened? You know, then she goes, oh yeah, no, I went with my dad to look at some apartment and then I didn't know, but this, this man came and um, he was in a wheelchair and he couldn't go up, but the kids went up. I think it was Ram, I think, who was there to look at some property. So Mr. Karpal ended up sitting next to her while um, her parents and, and the rest of the family went up to look at the show unit or something like this. Um, and uh, her father told her to sit with Mr. Karpal because surely you couldn't leave him alone sitting down there. So as, as she was sitting there, he began to chat with her and asked her what she wanted to do with life, and she said she wanted to be a pianist, and he said, why? <laughs> and then as, as the story goes, um, she says that he said, why don't you think about law? And, and next thing you know, she did law, and then she's a pupil with us at the moment. So the inspiration carries on in, in, ways, in weird and wonderful ways that I don't think we can even begin to understand. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, because um, in, in, in many ways, my pupil Joey would not have understood the impact Mr. Karpal had in the same way that, that we did. So an inspiration he is. Um, 
The other reason I would say he was an inspiration is because um, as, a, as a lawyer who tends to argue difficult, uh, meaning that's a euphemism for no hope cases, um, you tend to try and look for new ways to argue things. Um, and and you, you have to dig deep for ingenuity to, to find different ways of looking at the Constitution, different ways of looking at constitutional points. And that's something that um, Mr. Karpal did masterfully. You know, he would, he would, he would be unrelenting in the way he, he strove to find a way in which he could communicate his idea of what the Constitution represented, a living instrument that was there to protect us from the state and not to protect the state from us, which you know, some judges tend to think is the case. Um, but you know, fighting as he did against this wealth of precedent, all of which was stacked up against him in that, looking at the way he went in and went back and went again, um, w was inspiring for the fact that it said, well, you know, you keep on trying. And it echoed something that the late Raja Aziz also used to say, that you just have to keep on whacking your head against the wall, or the door, rather. And one day, the door might open, and you might see some light. You might have a headache, but you'll see that light. Right? So in that way, I think in many ways, Mr. Karpal was inspiring for the fact that, at least amongst the younger generation of lawyers who followed his work and who, who practiced in the same areas of public law, if not criminal law, his approach was an approach that we still apply. And, you know, and I can say that you know, in the last 10 years, that approach has, has paid dividends because we've gone back and this bench is now willing to hear us say that that decision from an earlier time, what I would call the constitutional dark ages, um, was wrongly decided. And this bench is prepared to say, why do you say that? And this bench is prepared to say, okay, I think you're right. It may say, I don't think you're right, but sometimes it says you're right and the door opens and some light shines through. So that, that's something that I think in many ways, I personally have a lot to thank Mr. Karpal for. <clears throat> now, in terms of his legacy, and this links to what I was talking about uh, in terms of the inspiration of the approach, the legacy is clear. His work stands as a testament to where things were um, at the time he unfortunately passed away. That body of work becomes a, a staging ground or a springboard for the work that the, the subsequent generation has done. And in, in particular, I think there are two or three decisions that stand out for me. Um, one in particular on uh, locus standi, or locus standi in public law, the right to bring uh, uh, an action. So you'll remember that he acted for Tan Sri uh, Lim in the UM case, which Tommy mentioned. And there the argument was that even though Tan Sri Lim was um, uh, uh, MP, uh, taxpayer, a leader of the opposition, he didn't have standing to challenge uh, a contract, a, a public procurement contract for the U, uh, North South Highway. And, and this, it's, this incredibly obtuse uh, test for uh, Locust Andy was developed and, and, and made the law. And that really put uh, a dampener on public interest litigation all the way through um, until um, this case called MTUC. So in MTUC, funnily enough, I was arguing it. And Mr. Karpal, who unfortunately at this stage was already in his wheelchair, was sitting in front of me with Gobin. I don't know if you remember this, but Mr. Karpal loved a good fight. I mean, we all know this. He just loved a good argument. And in court, if the argument was interesting or if it's something that he could get, he could get behind, he would be reacting. And he'd be like, he'd be, he'd, his, his mannerisms would be like he was watching a prize fight, uh, a boxing uh, match, right? So he was sitting in front of me and I'm making the point, trying to get permission to appeal, and he's like, yep, 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 right? And then Gobin looks at me, and he goes like this, right? <laughs> and, then, and then we get leave, and sometime later, we argued the appeal, and by chance, when the judgment was delivered, we won it on that point. We lost the appeal, but we won the point on Locus. They expanded it. Um, Mr. Kapal had to, happened to be downstairs in the Court of Appeal. Uh, this was in Putrajaya with uh, Tan Sri Lim. So they were doing some case. So I went down to tell Mr. Karpal, uh, YB, we've, 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 you succeeded. You know, you got your point in UEM vindicated today, and the federal court now agrees with you. He says, really? Kit, 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 they come. And then he organized a press conference. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I won the case, right? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that wouldn't have happened without the arguments that he made in, the, in, in, in Kit Siang. And, you know, he had the idea, and we just built on that. And, and, and we pushed it through. And, and recently, in the Nick Aline case, that 
has now come full circle with the federal court saying that in public interest case involving legislative actions on the part of the parliament and the state, any citizen has the right to petition. And that locus standi is now that wide, principally because of the arguments taken by Mr. Karpal in the UEM and Kitsiang case. You know, and that's, and that's the truth of it. Right, so I, I'd love to be able to say that it was all my idea and I came up with it from nothing. It's not the case. You know, we never do that. It's always built on the work of, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And, 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 that's, what, and that's what this is, is all about. So his legacy is clear to us as lawyers. His legacy, is as his legacy as a politician, I think, is equally clear, going back to what um, the former speakers have said. Um, he represented something. And you could, you could pretty much uh, put money on the fact that he was going to raise an issue outside if something was said. For example, perhaps if a pardon was being offered or otherwise. You know, I'm sure you would have heard from him on this. Um, he was that kind of politician. And it's something that I think we shouldn't be losing sight of because political expediency and real politic being what it is, I get that. It doesn't mean that principle uh, can be sacrificed. And I'm not making any suggestion to that effect, but I'm just saying that if we remember him for being that kind of politician, we are remembering him as a standard setter. And we are saying that the standards he set are the standards that we subscribe to. And that must mean something. It, it must mean something. Right, so very quickly then, moving on to his virtues as a, as a human being, and a lawyer, and a politician. Right, so <clears throat> integrity. I think nothing more really needs to be said about that. He was clearly a man of integrity, man of principle, and in particular in court. What I found interesting was, you know, you have politicians who are lawyers, and some of these lawyers who are politicians never quite forget their politicians when they're in court, when they're in court. So you see the politician in the lawyer in court. But with, with Mr. Karpal, it was never like that. And it's something that I think um, the judges, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Sri as well would agree with this, uh, respected because he was a lawyer. You know, he didn't bring his politics into the court. And he didn't try and make an argument for the sake of it, for grandstanding purpose, never. Never once did I see that in the, in the many times I watched him argue. It was the law. And the law led him in his argument. And that's why he made the succinct arguments. And that's why he argued the way he did. And that's why he was respected. You know, and that was something that was, was incredible to watch as a, as a young lawyer. And it's something that many of us seek to emulate now. Because all you need to do is that. And, and he was that, that special person, I suppose, who could do both. Who could be an outstanding politician who was controversial in his own way, widely respected, widely known, maybe some, to some extent disrespected, I don't know. But, you know, um, <clears throat> but at the same time, come into the court and be treated as a lawyer and nothing more. You know, so that's something that they tell us young lawyers sometimes, just be careful, don't bring your, you know, your activism into court. You don't want to be seen as pushing an activist point and so on. And Mr. Karpal was, was excellent at that. <clears throat> and so I, I, when, when I was preparing for this, um, I chanced on something that Ambiga, that Ambiga had written for his citation when he was awarded the 2016 uh, Malaysian Bar Lifetime Achievement Award. And Dato Ambiga quoted from um, Dato Mahadev Shankar's article that was published uh, in the Commonwealth Lawyer just after Mr. Karpal passed. The article was entitled, <clears throat> A Man Who Touched Many Minds and Many Hearts. And the excerpt that she reproduced there, I think is worth re uh, stating here, so I'm gonna just borrow it. And, and this is uh, attributed to Datuk Mahadev Shankar, the former Chief, uh, Court of Appeal judge. He says, to say that the man had charisma would be a gross understatement. From start to finish, he left nothing to speculation. He had the unique ability of penetrating the facade and get into the core of the material issues without beating about the bush. What stood out was his transparent honesty together with his powerful voice and command of the language never faltering as he moved like a juggernaut to the inexorable conclusion of his submission. Indeed, he was a colossus who was greater than the sum of his parts. And that, that, that says it all. That was the kind of lawyer he was. You know. um, and he could do that because of the amount of preparation he did and his mastery of his uh, brief, the facts, the law, and of course his belief in, in, in the law as he understood it. And that takes me to the other, other case that I'd like to just mention. 
Um, so, you know, we had this 1988 amendment to the federal constitution, which was hugely controversial. Um, but I'm not talking about the Islamic Sharia court part, no. I'm talking about the one which said that the, the power and jurisdiction of the, federal, of the high court is what the uh, parliament confers on, on, the, on the judiciary. So this is important for this reason. <clears throat> Up to 88, the bench was free to say that they had powers to give judicial review. After that, if parliament said you didn't have the power to give judicial review, you no longer had it, which is a problem. So what, what then happens is you have the executive uh, immunizing itself from review and therefore now putting itself above the judiciary and legislature and undermining the doctrine of separation of powers. But of course, if you're going to go to court and say that this is an unconstitutional amendment, you are going to lose. But what Mr. Karpal said was that even if that is the case, it must necessarily mean that the power of the court is intact. Because how could you take away the power of the court in a, in a, in a, in a system where there is the separation of powers? Um, brilliant. So he didn't need to take the hard argument. He took the, the, the slightly less sexy argument, in a way, and the Court of Appeal agreed with him. And the judgment was delivered for the court by Justice Sri Ram. Now, then it was appealed. This is a case called Kwok Wa Kwan. And in Kwok Wa Kwan, the federal court, by a majority of four, said we don't have the doctrine of separation of powers. And I remember meeting him soon after that decision. He says, do you understand what that means? I said, I have no idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> because we have the three organs of state. But he was willing to take that argument at a point when many lawyers felt that it was something that they didn't want to necessarily push and so on. But in 2016, unfortunately, after his passing, the federal court agreed with that argument and actually has gone so far as to say that that amendment was unconstitutional because you can't take away judicial power from the judiciary. If you take it away, where does it go? And that was the argument he made in Kwok Wa in his own way, which then found favor with the federal court in a case called Samania Jaya, which becomes the watershed decision for constitutional laws. We now know it. This led to all the other decisions, including the basic structure argument, which was really a part of what Mr. Kappa was arguing in Kok Wa Kwan, where, which dealt with the juvenile and, and, the, and the detention at, at um, that pleasure. So he says that's a judicial, so a juvenile being detained at the executive discretion without the benefit of a court order or the court having supervised that, that detention. So that too has become integral to what we, we now understand as Malaysian constitutional law. In Samania Jaya, the federal court said that the previous federal court decision, four to one, was wrong. And they've departed from it. And the minority was Justice Richard Malanjum, later Chief Justice. And they said that he had got it right because he says, obviously, we have a separation of powers in our constitution. So that, too, is part of the legacy of, of Mr. Karpal. And it's part of that process of integrity and humility that, that so marks him. I'll just close by saying this. Um, <clears throat> his humility, I think, is also uh, spoken of uh, um, broadly. Everyone, everyone says it. And as a young lawyer, I can say very, 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 very unequivocally that it was clear even to me as a young lawyer, and I'm leaving aside the fact that he was a family friend and so on. In court, he was ever willing to hear points of view from young lawyers. He would ask, what do you think about this? Do you have a view? I remember when, when during the first Anwar trial, Augustine Paul had said something quite unpleasant about Christopher Fernando, and so uh, Mr. Carpal moved contempt proceedings against the judge. And that came before another high court judge, um, Justice Hashim Yusuf, and I was then instructed by the bar to appear on a watch brief. And he's looking at me, he says, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here for the bar. Does the bar agree or disagree? He says, I think we agree. All right then, all right, you can sit here then. <laughs> But as, as the arguments proceeded, the judge was also intrigued by this whole thing. Can it be done? Can, can I find another judge in contempt? You know, he would turn around and say, what do you think? You know, because I think he was kind of hoping that we had researched it a little bit more or something. I don't know. The assumption was that we had a bigger access to resource and so on. But this, this continued throughout. And of course, underlying all of that was the, was the, was the wicked sense of humor, you know, both personally as well as in, in court and, and, and in parliament. And um, I'll just end by, by, making, by sharing this anecdote. So we were doing the Teo Bing Hawk case. And I was there for the slang of state. Uh, Mr. Karpal was there with Mr. Gobin for um, the family. 
And this was the day when counsel for the MACC, Dato Razak, um, was, I'm not sure what he was saying really, he was quite unintelligible <laughs> with all respect, but he was making some statements. And Mr. Kapal was saying, enough, Razak, enough, sit, 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 right? So of course Razak is getting irritated and Mr. Kapal is saying, okay, enough, sit, 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 right? And then finally um, uh, Razak says, uh, I can sit but you can't stand. Oh, very, very, very unfortunate. I'm thinking, oh no. Gobin then jumps up and he is all fire and brimstone. He is attacking, he's saying, you kurang aja, you tare bale, all that stuff is happening, right? And Mr. Kapal is like, Gobin, enough, Gobin, boy, enough, sit, boy. Then, then, then he says, no, pa, I've got to say this, it's not right, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, it's not right, how can he say that? Enough, enough. And then after a while, Gobin says, okay, I'm sitting down. Then Mr. Kapal started abusing Razak, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then he sort of looked over and smiled and he says, you know, well, I wanted a chance to abuse him as well, right? <laughs> so that was the man and it's somebody that I think the bar misses tremendously and it's someone that, you know, um, I, I would have loved for him to have seen what, what the current state of the law is and, and to have seen how things have changed and um, yes, so may he rest in peace. Thank you.